good. Are we staying at that same Crown Plaza that I'm staying at now? Are you playing um, why not? Name? No, 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 no. Are you here downtown? Probably. Yeah, we're right here. No, I'm going to walk down here. Downtown. Yeah, because yeah. we're at 38. Yeah, you're at 38. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's so many of them, I get them all confused. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Uh, what a great turnout. Thank you all for, for coming out this morning. And uh, I, I have been looking for, by the way, my name is Jason Chanos. I'm the interim artistic director here at the REF. And I have had the, the fortune of, of shepherding this company through an extraordinary season of shows. Uh, and I have been looking forward to this day all year long. I want to do a little call out to we are live streaming on HowlAround. Just want to say hi to all of our hi friends hi. and guests that are there. Um, you know, sometimes when you're in a position like mine, you get lost in the minutia of the day-to-day -day details of producing. It's so wonderful to be able to invite people to my home and elevate the conversation to the 30,000 foot level and just re recharge my batteries with, uh, with inspiration and art. And one of the smartest things I did this year was hire Kim Martin Cotton as my assistant artistic director and Lisa Rothi as my director of new works. Yeah. So I am, they uh, together have produced this amazing schedule of events today and tomorrow and I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa as our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, Liz. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Lisa Rothi. I would really love everyone to actually, just before we get started, can you just turn to somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself and also tell them what your favorite dessert is? <laughs> just do that. <laughs> Hi. What's your no. favorite dessert? I know <laughs> you're not. Oh, interesting. I will go with this bizarre thing that my family makes called Japanese fruit pie, which has nothing to do with Japan or fruit. It's like a chess pie with nuts and raisins and sultanas and coconut. Okay, it's so it's 9.45 in the morning, <laughs> and we're talking about dessert. That's okay, that's good, so thank you. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, Kansas City. I've never been to Kansas City. This is my third week here in Kansas City, so I'm really thrilled to be here. Everyone has been incredibly welcoming. And um, I, I want to also just give out a shout out to the previous administration, actually, who made uh, this festival happen, and actually all of the plays that are here. Um, so I'm happy to be helping to shepherd uh, this festival through. Um, so. Today, we're just gonna jump right into this. We're here to talk about new plays, new work, and um, it's pretty simple at this point. Really just wanted to talk about why and how. And on this panel, I have this extraordinary group of women who have done, who, who are kind of the new play unicorns. <laughs> and actually, and we have the head unicorn here with us. Great. <laughs> Um, so, and actually, uh, I think Kelly Miller, you were the person who actually um, introduced me to the coined, uh, the new play unicorn yeah. term. It's all, it's everywhere. It's all <laughs> So, um, great. So, I'm just going to, there are programs here. I don't know if everyone got a program. So, we have bios of our friends. Um, I'm just going to throw out a few extra things. Um, and say that, so, Kelly Miller is a TV lit manager at Literate in L.A. Um, recently, she served as a theater-to-TV crossover agent at Paradigm, 
the director of development for the New Neighborhood, and at South Coast Rep's uh, literary director and the co-director of the Pacific Playwrights Festival from 2009 to 2015. Um, and also, something else that isn't listed here is just wanted to also point out is um, Kelly is one of the founding members of the Kilroys, um, which is a group of 13 activists who've banded together to create a powerful force working toward gender parity, I'm reading this from their website, um, <laughs> with an abundance mentality and their work with deceptive simplicity. Um, and, uh, and so their work consists of publishing a list of plays each year written by women, trans, and non-binary -bin playwrights. Um, so we're thrilled to have you here, Kelly Miller. Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, great. And so next to her, we have Martine Green Rogers. And do you say K? Key. 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 Martine Key. Thank you. I should have asked that before. But here we are. We're, we're, gonna, we're here learning about great. each other. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> so um, Martine Key Green Rogers, she's an assistant professor at SUNY New Paltz a freelance dramaturg, and the president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of America, which is extraordinary. And um, she the also Americas. was the, huh? The Americas. The, oh, the, the Americas. Americas. Does it say here, the <laughs> Americas? Yes, it does. <laughs> the Americas, <laughs> they learn how to read. We encompass both Mexico and Canada. Thank we're you. We're moving slowly, slowly, slowly down, but not in a weird colonist, colonist kind of way. No, okay, no. <laughs> I wouldn't expect that. Okay, we're just great. Not gathering Thank you. Who like the dramaturg thing. <laughs> And you were also the production dramaturg for six seasons at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Woo! That's yeah. pretty extraordinary. Okay, so Martine, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> um, great. So Nan Barnett is here. She is the executive director of the National New Play Network, which is um, this country's alliance of 125 theaters that collaborate to develop, produce, and extend the life of new plays. Um, she helped create several of the organization's uh, initiatives, including its Rolling World Premier Residency and Collaboration Programs. And um, she led the organization through the development and launch of uh, this field-altering database called the New Play Exchange, which is now home to over 25,000 plays by living writers, which is really extraordinary. I mean, that's what I have 25, here. 25,768. Oh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> nice. That's good. Thank you for that You're statistic. Welcome. Yes. I love looking it up. Every <laughs> day. Um, and prior to NNPM, she was more uh, than 25 years is uh, in Palm Beach with Florida Stage, um, and uh, you developed more than 200 new plays and musicals there. Excellent. And also now based in D.C., Nan is serving. Uh, she was the coordinating producer of the Women's Voices Theater Festival in 2015 and in 2018. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and finally, the, um, the, the, the goddess of unicorns. <laughs> um, right, take it, take it. Um, so uh, Cynthia is, Cynthia, and it's Levin. Very good. Levin, Cynthia Levin, excellent, thank you. Been working on that. Um, founded in 1974, the unicorn um, uh, uh, enhances Kansas City by developing, producing professional, provocative new plays. And I, I found this on your website. I'm just going to read this because I thought this was pretty, I, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Unicorn Theater chooses plays, most of which are less than five years old, that have never been performed in Kansas City or often anywhere at all. Um, the Unicorn looks for plays about strong female characters, people of color, LGBT, and any marginalized group. So under the leadership um, and executive leadership of producing artistic director Cynthia Levin, the theater has produced more than 300 productions, with 20% of those being world premieres, which is extraordinary. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you. Um, so we, you know, we were basically kind of having this conversation last night and sitting out in the hall and at various festivals we've been at and met, but I really, I would love you to be able to share and talk a little bit about, you are an advocate for new plays and development. Why? And to what end? And it's kind of broad, but why and to what end? Why is it that, and, and, the, and then we'll talk a little bit about the how and what it is that you all have done and to contribute um, to the conversation about new plays. So... Who, who would like to start? I'll start. I'd yes, like to great. state the obvious. Do you want to use the microphone? Or I don't know. Can Hello? You, maybe this might be good for the howl round, right? Is yeah. that good? Thank Somebody you. just said, okay. I just heard someone say that a microphone is not for the person who's using it. Right. 
right? Right, so that's right. I, I'm trying to embrace that. Thank you. Right, because I never use a microphone. I know, I hate them. <laughs> just like that stated in the I record, know. please. <laughs> Um, I would just, I'll state the obvious of that we have to do new plays because it's the future of the American theater. It's the future of theater at all. And it's the only thing that's fun and interesting to do um, <laughs> is, is that, you know, to find the topics that are, that are going on right now. I mean, they change every year or two. It's a completely different concept and style of writing. Um, it's the most fascinating experience uh, that you could have in the theater is to work on new plays. But it is, it's the future, and I think that's a lot of why we had started the NNPN, the National New Play Network, is for all of us to come together and share those resources to do it better mm -hmm. and bigger. And I think that's what's happening now, which is incredible. Actually, and, and also, you were also a founding member of mm -hmm. NNPN too, so I also just wanna state that for the record too, yes. so that that's part of the conversation, thank you. Okay. I think for me, um, when I'm, I'm, uh, I really love playwrights. I love how their minds work. As someone who um, has no capability whatsoever to put dialogue onto a page, I'm fascinated by that. But the, as our friend British Billy says, if you're going to hold a mirror up to society, um, if you stop putting that mirror up, then you stop with your reflections of society, right? So if we as theater makers are in a place where we can help people understand themselves, understand each other, then we need to be m continuing to make that new work as the world evolves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I get really excited about the, the, the way in which a writer can take a current situation that we're all dealing with it and put it into a framework that allows us to maybe drop our incoming ideas and learn something new. So that's why new plays for me. Okay. I think for me, the f well, number one, I'm a dramaturg, duh. But number two, <laughs> I think to me it's also about access. Because if, if you think about like what we consider, and especially as an educator as well, what is considered canonical, dramatic literature, like, where are the people who look like me? And there aren't as many. And the reason why is because access was a problem. And so, to me, being an advocate for new plays is making sure that everyone has an opportunity to tell the story that they want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in my role as dramaturg, really helping to foster that. And in that way, it's about embracing all sorts of dramatic structures because there are all sorts of ways to tell a story that come from all sorts of different cultural backgrounds and saying that those are okay, as opposed to, I think what had kind of happened and led to issues of access where we said that if it only fit into this particular pattern mm -hmm. and this particular structure, it wasn't a good play, yeah. um, which I just find highly problematic to begin with. I'm like, let's tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't care what the structure looks like. If it's a good story, it's a good story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyway, I digress. No, all of that was <laughs> right on point. Mm -hmm. um, to build on that, I was gonna actually mention, like, thank you for joining us this morning to contribute to the New American Play Canon. Yes. All of you are joining us in the New American Play Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Every single person here, everyone you speak to, your advocacy, your action has real tangible results. Mm -hmm. It means dollars in playwrights' pockets. It means support for uh, everything from your, you know, uh, reading series or uh, local theater to well-established theaters like KC Rep. Um, thank you, thank you for being here with your bodies, your minds, and your hearts, because this is where it begins, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Um, and I, for me, it's a love of playwrights, a love of community, of being in conversation together. And speaking of access, part of the Kilroys in the list was about proving to the field the sheer abundance um, po in a positive, proactive way, showing producers and theaters the sheer abundance of phenomenal material by women, trans, and non-binary writers, right? And I think we have this incredible um, vanguard and revolutionary vanguard of leaders in the American theater, uh, both new and old and established in conversation together with you, the audiences, who are also leading that charge um, to um, present a multiplicity of voices, regionally, New York, everywhere. And that's what gets me up in the morning. Great, great thank you. That's a great start. Great, uh, thank you for the frame. Um, so, um, you all have contributed um, after we, you had the conversation about the need, you're like, there's a need out there. 
and developed an organization or um, a platform for voices to be heard. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about the, the, the seed of that and the genesis of that and kind of the how that you did that. So I'm wondering if you want to talk about Sure, sure. Um, the Unicorn was founded 45 years ago, and part of that was you know, contemporary theater, but also of world premieres. And um, I took it over 40 years ago, and the the thrust was doing, of course, all you know, new plays and finding playwrights because in the commercial theater and in the published versions of plays, it was a very strictly white heterosexual world and male world. And I wanted to find uh, playwrights, uh, female playwrights and people of color, which came down to, of course, finding female playwrights of color. And they were not published. There was no way to find these voices. And so to set out to how do you find plays. And at that time, there was no resource. There was no way, a connection of go, on, go online you know, and find these people or, or talk, you know, there were a few other theaters we knew of, but a lot of, nobody in Kansas City was doing new plays mm -hmm. at the time. And so it was just a fascinating experience to find voices that were disenfranchised, that were not, that you wouldn't turn on the television and then see. And um, so that was when the commitment came. And of course, turning people on in Kansas City to new plays was arduous. <laughs> Peop, you know, the, my board kept saying, don't you think we should just drop the new play idea Nobody ever comes, you know, and it's like, no, <laughs> it's the seed of the future, <laughs> right? And, and so to, to have to keep doing it and the sophistication level, of course, you know, I mean, if you don't do it, nobody knows they even want it. So that was sort of, I mean, we just started, it was very isolating experience to just, you know, myself to go out and find playwrights. But we created a competition. So we had a playwriting competition for years and so we could get it in every publication and we could get it out so that at least we could maybe elicit response from writers who, you know, through, through a different channel, not through a publishing uh, house or, you know, a festival. There weren't a lot of festivals, maybe the Humana, of course, but um, so it was really, really just fascinating to try to find the writers before really that we started the NNPN where we can, you know, now we can find writers at least and they can find us. Remind me of the question. Oh, I got so yeah. into Cynthia's yeah. answer that yeah. I forgot what I answer what the I, question. You did you answer for sure. all you of us? You could piggyback off. Of it's of, it's of about Cynthia's. how. Yes, yes. I think we talked about the need a little bit, and we can discuss that the a little seed. bit later. But mm -hmm. kind of yeah, the seed. Well, I I can let me talk a little bit about National New Play Network. Mm -hmm. um, so we're the organization just had its twentieth anniversary, and um, we are now, as you mentioned, a hundred and. 25 theaters ranging in budget size from $50,000 a year annually all the way up through whatever the big guys are, close to $50 million a year. Um, and these are theaters, some of which do one new play a year, some of which do only new plays every year. Um, the organization was founded under this idea or the, the knowledge that Two, two things, really. One, there were wonderful writers making great new plays all over the country. And there was no way without the uh, seal of approval of the New York Times to really m spread those plays out across the country. There was no pipeline for moving those plays from theater to theater. So those eight uh, artistic directors that were in that initial meeting started talking to each other and saying, oh, I've got this great playwright, or we just did this wonderful play. And so the word began to circulate in that way. Uh, and the group grew and formalized into the network. Then the next big thing that we, the organization attempted to combat was premier-itis, or what we call the one and done syndrome, where uh, yes, a play would get a premiere, but then it wasn't, artistic directors didn't consider it sexy if it wasn't a world premiere. So playwrights couldn't get a second production or a third production and help to build their careers. So we created the Rolling World Premiere Program where three, if three or more artistic directors agree to produce a new play before it ever begins rehearsal, within a 12 month period, each with a set entirely separate artistic team, 
then NNPN provides support, financial support, uh, as well as staff support uh, to help that playwright move from city to city and see that play in front of a wide variety of audiences, often in vastly different spaces. So a playwright might um, open their play in 125 seat theater in Portland, Oregon, and then see that same play uh, with a budget five times that size in a 450 seat theater in San Diego, and then go see it uh, and be a part of the rehearsal process of bringing that play to a 49 seat theater in the basement of a town hall in <laughs> Berwyn, Illinois, yeah. right? So the, play, the playwright gets to see it in the hands of different directors, see their play coming out of the mouths of different actors, look at different designs, very different spaces, and most importantly, I think, get the responses of audiences. It's a very different thing to develop a play in front of an audience as opposed to just doing the development work in a rehearsal hall or in even if the reading with an audience. Uh, but to, to actually fully mount the play and have it seen by multiple audiences and watch its growth is very different. And so the playwright is working on the play at each stop, tweaking, changing. I had a, a wonderful experience with How to Use a Knife, uh, which you guys did here as part of the role, um, where the playwright said to me, you know, 70 minutes into the play at the first theater, there was this little dip in the energy of the play. And I thought, oh, that director just did not get it. And then when he saw the second production and <laughs> 70 minutes into the play, there was that little dip, he was like, damn, that actor, <laughs> why did they not get that? And then when he saw the third production, he was like, maybe this is a problem I can solve, right? <laughs> so sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it's about, you know, uh, when I was producing um, theater in the Palm Beaches, did you guys also do um, Deb Lawfer's post 9-11 play, End Days? No. No, End Days is a play that um, has a, one of the characters is a young man who um, is, lives his life as late uh, life Elvis. He wears like jumpsuits and <laughs> be bejeweled things. And he's in the midst of trying to do his bar mitzvah. And so in Palm Beach, when you do the bar mitzvah prayers, the audience says them along with you. Oh, wow. In Indianapolis, when she when he did the bar mitzvah plays, people had no context for it. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing you would have never learned without a second production, right? So it's that program has become uh, NNPN's cornerstone, uh, and so the the how of creating a pipeline, providing support for both the writer and the play, with the idea that then we are ginning up interest so that play goes on and doesn't just get those three to five productions we're working on, but has an additional five, 10. I think um, George Brandt's Grounded is now up to like 125 Hey, we did that one. You did that one too. You were part of the Rolling World yep. premiere of that, and yep. now that play is at 125 productions, and then Hathaway did it at the public, and, um, and that was an NNPN commission as well. Yeah, that was pretty cool, going to New York and seeing Anne Hathaway do the role that Carla Nowak did. Nice. <laughs> Before. Nice. <laughs> right. May I piggyback on that yes, just for please. a second? It reminds me of sort of the difference, I think, with the NNPN, because the Unicorn has always done new plays. We have always done world premieres. The difference is when we started the NNPN, and I joined with, at the time, you know, eight other people, but um, the development of new plays. We produced new plays. We had nothing in place to bring playwrights in and to have a workshop and do readings and all of the things that it takes to actually get a play ready to be produced. We would just produce them. And of course you learn a lot from that, the playwright and, and, and us, but the idea now of a development process, which for us now takes a year. I mean, from getting to know the playwrights and doing readings mm -hmm. and doing workshops, that has been the change that I've seen happen, right. that there's more help in getting that play ready, which is, is and it's an amazing process to be part of, and it, you know, it's not a solitary playwright having to do everything by themselves anymore. And also because the plays are being developed through production, yes. 
which is extraordinary. And that's mm -hmm. something actually that I'm really interested in and what's happening here as well is just in terms of what the development process is and that to develop a play over three or four productions also because it's not like the play s is done the for that first production, right? right? So depending on the conversations that are happening around it with different audiences, different directors, et cetera, that, that changes, yeah? We've yeah. often been the third production in a Rolling World premiere of the three. Mm -hmm. And the playwright is still there, mm -hmm. and they're still rewriting, mm -hmm. and we're still working on it. That's it's like, awesome. you know, and you take everything you learn, and it just kind of snowballs right. into a big old snow woman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think for me, there's sort of two tracks that I answer. Number one, in my capacity as president of LMDA, one of the things that we're very focused on is, you know, <coughs> I'm going to sound like a broken record after a while, but it's about access. And so <laughs> number one, um, my VP for programs, uh, Phaedra Scott, um, who I believe is actually getting married this weekend. Yay, Phaedra. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she started uh, a book or a play reading club amongst our early career dramaturgs, because I think one of the things that becomes really important, and this sort of plays into another aspect of my life as an educator, but really teaching dramaturgs who are coming through how to read new plays, because I think that is something that we are not, uh, as educators, sometimes not so great about, depending on the particular institution. So how do we get... Talk a little bit about what a dramaturg does. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I just always assume people know because we're so <laughs> cool and sexy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you are. Thank you. More people should be aware right. of your sexiness. Right. Thank true. you. Uh, so it's that's a really interesting question that you've just sort of cracked open. I think uh, some of the simplest ways to describe what it is that we do, especially in terms of new play development, would be that we are uh, as a as an editor is to a novel, a, a dramaturg is to a, a play. Um, but then there's also more to that, because in a lot of ways we become advocates for new play, and in some ways, and to talk a little bit about that, one of the things that we do, for example, at our annual conference every year is a session called Playwrights Under the Radar, where we literally pitch plays to other dramaturgs and literary managers to say, you need to pay attention to this playwright, and here are all the amazing reasons why. So really to spread knowledge about uh, people in our particular regions, or even just within our own purview, because we've worked uh, with them at a theater that maybe not everyone knows. And especially considering our conference is populated by both institutional dramaturgs, freelance dramaturgs, and educational dramaturgs, that becomes the way that we can get new plays into educational settings. So people all of a sudden are like, oh, well, that play sounds really interesting, and with the number of people in it, that might work for my educational institute, uh, institution, et cetera. So, you know, we're advocates, uh, we are people who are there to be, and I, and I say this with massive amounts of intentionality and love, we are there to be a playwright's best friend. And I don't mean best friend as in like, you know, oh yeah, 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 and we can like kiki and like laugh and, and stuff. Well, I mean, we can do that. But then we're also that person that does the proverbial, like if you, if you ask me like, is my skirt too short? Or, you know, does this make me look fat? The answer is, Yes, <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> but you know, always with love. It's always with love. And so, and, and in the same way, like when someone's you know, play slash dress is looking fly, you say yes, wear that. <laughs> let's get it out there. Let's t let's show, let's parade that around and show everybody. Go ahead, walk that play strut. So. <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> in some ways that is what dramaturgs we do. We all could use I a love, dramaturg how, in our lives. Right? Right. <laughs> Everyone I needs need a personal one. dramaturg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so in, in that way, we are really there to help champion, to, to help craft, to help uh, spread the word, to help uh, infiltrate systems, because I think a lot of also what we talk about within our own organization, and we've been doing a lot of work within our own organization about this, is really discovering, like, what are our own biases and other sort of institutional and like systemic uh, issues of racism, sexism, et cetera, that might stop someone from passing a play along. Really sort of, that is what we have been internally doing because we want to make sure that we are giving everyone who has a really great story to tell a chance to actually p get that put in front of people who might be interested in telling that story. Mm -hmm. So 
so yeah, and then you know, as an educator, it's kind of the same thing. I'm a glutton for punishment, so one of the strategic <laughs> things that I did as I became president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas, I also became the uh, conference planner for the Dramaturgy Focus Group for the Association for Theater and Higher Education. And part of that was because I wanted to figure out what was that gap that was happening between the profession of dramaturgy and the profession and, and the educational aspect of it, because I'm figuring if I can close some of those gaps, we get back into then being able to have conversations about these great playwrights, how to teach our students to do these, uh, to read a play, to understand a play, to meet a play on its own terms, and meet a playwright on their terms. And so as a result of that, we've had more sessions within the dramaturgy focus group about what are the cool plays that are really great for a college age audience and you know why you know um, sort of answering questions why this play why this play now within our own ranks which just makes it stronger when those dramaturgs educational dramaturgs go back into their own institutions and want to advocate for new plays in their uh, institutions so anyway I should probably stop talking but <laughs> no that's Thank perfect you. have more coffee <laughs> Yes. Good. So I think I'm going to start with the Kilroys, and then maybe I can tack a little on about uh, playwrights and TV. Um, so the Kilroys started back in 2013, um, and I should say I'm a member of the 13 co-founding members. We just named a new class of Kilroys and handed off the day-to-day -day operation, the entire group, to this new class of Kilroys. So all love to the new class, to the <laughs> continuum, to your phenomenal ideas. They are in the trenches right now, creating the next list. So here's uh, we came about in part um, out of a need for community and in a response to implicit bias and a lack of access to um, the huge uh, depth of great work uh, by female trans and uh, gender um, uh, non-conforming writers in the American theater. So Anna Feinberg, who's a dramaturg out of Columbia, playwright, now she's an animator and a, a humorist. You should check her out online. She hosted, moved to LA um, and threw a barbecue for all of her friends. About two, three weeks in, 2013, the summer, only women showed up and it was the core group that would become the Kilroys. Mm -hmm. And uh, the group that was there included folks like Tanya Siracho, who created Vita. They're actually, a little shout out to Tanya, they're about to roll the second season, May 23rd, which is one of the most progressive and inclusive uh, TV staffs in all of Hollywood. In fact, all of anywhere in, in the world, an entirely Latinx um, writing staff uh, and crew. Uh, folks like Sarah Gubbins, who's created shows for Amazon. Playwrights who had been out, in, most of us were expats from New York and Chicago who had moved to LA in part to do theater or to also begin to do television. Uh, there were 11 playwrights and two producers slash literary managers. I was running the South Coast Rep's literary department then and Joy Muse was running Center Theater Group. And part of the conversation when it's only women often comes around to uh, bias, bias in the workplace, lack of gender uh, equity, whether it be in pay or in representation or aggressions, macro and micro. Uh, but pretty quickly this group, which was meeting over potluck every month, because again, community, LA is very spread out, and we were, s we were missing uh, a sense of, of connectivity and solidarity, really, really turned and pivoted to action. We're a guerrilla, sort of guerrilla girl style, a little bit anarchist kind of volunteer um, uh, activist group, but we were done talking about the, the problems, and we wanted to provide positive, proactive solutions. Again, if we were addressing the problem in the American theater, and back then these numbers have gotten better, yeah, right? This is to everyone doing the work, yep. right? In the American theater, but it was holding pretty uh, stubborn that in most parts of the country, only 21 to 23 percent of all new plays in the country were produced by female or trans writers. Uh, went over well over 50 percent of the ticket buying population as population female and or trans. Um, that's gotten better. I want to give a shout out to the Lilies, to all the groups who've been doing this work for decades, at the P Theater, New Georges, et cetera, et cetera. This work is on the back of, and, and, and we're able to do this work because of the phenomenal work that's been done for decades, right, by many activists in the community. Um, but basically, we quickly pivoted to action. We, we really started having, uh, we had this one night where we sort of put white sheets up and went through every possible thing we could do. Title IX for the American theater. Like what, is the, <laughs> what is the biggest, boldest thing that we could do? And we settled on something inspired by something in LA called the Blacklist. Do any of you know about this list? Mm. Yeah, great. <coughs> yeah. Hi. So in 2005, Franklin Leonard, this is an, a list that still exists, introduced a list in Hollywood where he went out to all the young executives reading in town and asked them for their favorite, most excellent screenplays to nominate. It was a very small, sort of powerful, um, um, really political kind of free, because people didn't know the list existed, list. And things like, um, uh, Argo, The King's Speech, things that went on to get produced from this list have since hit many, many award shows, many lists. And we thought, what if there was a version of that for female and trans writers in the American theater? 
Now, we, we didn't know what we were going to get the first year. We went out to over 330 nominators. We heard back from 128 folks. We asked them to nominate three to five new plays who had not been produced or not more than one production, to go back to what Nan said about premiere-itis. We didn't want people just running for the things that hadn't been produced. We wanted to give playwrights to show that that second production was important and powerful. Um, we didn't know what we were going to get. We were going to get like, you know, 50 votes for the same amazing Annie Baker play that had just hit the New York Times. We didn't know what we were going to get, right? We got th over 330 plays nominated. Um, <coughs> and so we decided that first year, while we were trying to figure out what would make the list um, usable, and I'm a bit of a theater socialist. I mean, I might have had 100 plays on that first list. We had 46 plays that hit, but we decided that first year to publish every single play that had been nominated. So you could see that other writers might have four to six plays that were battling it out primary position on the list. We did. Four, we rolled the list in the New York Times, it went viral, people picked it up and were advocating for the playwrights, for theaters. Um, other artists were saying, hey, there's some phenomenal uh, writers on this list, but also check out these other 30, right? It was an active conversation about the new play pipeline, about abundance, not scarcity, not I can't find these plays. We do, and, and also, if you think about it, the implicit bias that's often had been lofted by some leaders around the same time, actually, in 2014, whew, that they just couldn't find good plays by female or trans writers. They just programmed the best play. And if you step back from that, then that's implying that the best plays are predominantly by men. Mm -hmm. Because many of the folks that were saying this would often have a season of six to 10 plays. In a season, only one or two slots that would go to uh, female writers or writers of color. And often, sometimes in the both slot, in the same right. slot. Um, so, but what was exciting to us, honestly, truly, you all, is this cracked the new play pipeline open to the entire country and abroad. Um, I think I sort of understood the viral nature, the implicit viral nature in Franklin Leonard's list. I believe most big ideas are implicitly simple. Um, and when you apply good press and viral uh, social media to this, things can amplify. But what happened, too, is that suddenly these plays, which would take so long to get through development, through production, to hopefully get an okay review from the New York Times, or from your regional theater, uh, regional papers, they didn't have to clear that bar anymore and suddenly the plays are going directly into the hands of directors, artistic directors, students, who are then taking these lists to their academic boards, their chairs, quite literally allowing a whole new generation and generations of other theater makers direct access to the plays and playwrights. And this also, going back to NMPN, and the new play exchange is exactly what, Nan, what you all have been doing, is providing access and platform to literally thousands of playwrights. Well, and we started hooking up and doing, now yeah. the Kilroy's list, everybody that's on the list is on the exchange. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the first things that, one of the first things that I did when I took over the reins of LMDA was start to work with NNPN to make sure that we uh, made an arrangement so that um, if you were a member of LMDA, you could then get a discounted membership into NNPN, which then gave Cracked Open even more access to plays. So we're talking about these playwrights under the radar. Now they can actually go find these playwrights and get the access to the work. So Can I talk just a little bit about Please. the exchange? Yes, because I was like, I wanted to let people know right. how they could access these plays. Sure. So this is the, it, it's, we knew that there was a pent up need for an electronic database of new works, plays that had not yet been published. And after a wonderfully supported by the Doris Duke Charitable Fund and the Mellon Foundation, about 18 months of research visiting 20 plus cities across the country where we sat in rooms like this with audience members, with actors, with playwrights, with dramaturgs, with literary managers, with artistic directors and said, if there was a tool like this, what would you want it to do? What would you not want it to do? Um, we developed this thing that became the New Play Exchange, or NPX. Um, the pent up need for it um, pushed us to what we had set as our annual goal for um, incoming funds from the tool. Uh, we hit that goal at the end of the year, but at our 17 after we launched. Um, as I said, now more than 25,000 plays, more than 15,000 users in 30 plus countries. And here is the beauty of it. A playwright goes on and creates a profile. They put up their photo or an image, their bio, and then they begin to upload their work. They put up their full plays, 
and then they tag it with both metadata and keywords, things like genre and cast size, of course, but also the keywords, what the topics are, and now, most recently, not only what the cast is, but also what actors you want to use the play. Then those plays are there and they are discoverable by anyone who wants to go on and look. So you can go on, and by you I mean everyone, because one of the really magnificent things about it is you can get a base subscription for $10 a year. And for $10 a year, you have access to those nearly 26,000 plays, all of whom, all of which are sortable and searchable. So, for example, if you want to go in and you say, today I would really like to read five 10-minute plays about social justice in the United States, and I want those plays to have never been produced before, and I want them to be by a woman playwright living in Missouri, and I would really like it if each of those plays had four actors or less, two of whom are over 60 and female. <laughs> you can do that, <laughs> right? I had a woman say to me at an event uh, in Philly not too long ago, she came up to me afterwards and she said, I'm not a theater person, I just came with my friend to come to this event tonight and I just need a little clarification on this. And I said yes and she said, you're saying to me, I can go on and read a play about any topic I want. And I said, yeah. And she said, you mean like I could go on and read a play about bitter ex-wives in their 50s <laughs> for $10 a year. <laughs> and I said, yes, and she said, can you tell me something? And I said, yes, and she said, why am I paying a therapist? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't know, but I think New Play Exchange will be much cheaper for you, so have at it. Um, but we are just beginning to really talk to audiences about it, so we did a, you know, a ton of work rolling out and getting to whatever the number is, uh, almost 7,000 playwrights uh, who have their works on there. Um, we have obviously really looped in our literary managers and dramaturgs. We have looped in our directors. Nicole just told me this morning she's developed a wonderful relationship with a playwright that she met through the exchange, and we hear that all the time. What I really love is that what we're hearing now is productions, productions. I, no theater in Cincinnati just let us know that of their past four seasons, almost 40% of what they had produced were plays they had found on the exchange. We just had two different playwrights tell us that their 10-minute plays had been picked up by different high schools in Japan for a competition in South Korea. Um, I mean, it is, it's, it is worldwide now. And it's creating a worldwide community. Right. It's really. creating a worldwide community. And you don't have to wait till the play is published. And for publishing houses, um, we are, they love us now because when you do get your play published, you just take down the script and put up the link. So if you want to read that play, it drives you straight into the sales site of where you can get it. Um, it also is unadjudicated. So if you want to read a, that play about bitter ex-wives in their 50s, you don't it doesn't have to be a play that by a playwright that's famous, right? It's just the play that speaks to you in that moment. Uh, we've had people that have never had plays even read out loud before get productions in other countries. We've had um, young writers, one of our early successes was a, a, a college looking for plays about, uh, I can't remember what topic it was, some specific topic and they found a play they loved and then discovered that the writer was like an eighth grader, <laughs> right? Because it's not, you don't, it doesn't matter, right? So I encourage you, so the, at, we've increased our prices for the very highest subscription for an individual. It now costs, I'm really sorry to tell you, $18 a year. <laughs> um, but I encourage you, it's newplayexchange.org. Uh, um, you can find it through any site, you can find it just type in New Play Exchange on Google, it'll pop right up. Join, if you have ever any thought about wanting to 
learn more about theater or reading a play about something or what maybe what it's what is someone in Wichita thinking about what's happening in Kansas City or you know just a, a global look immediately accessed at your fingertips through this online tool. That was a great yeah. global example. Wichita, and Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> International. I loved it. Well, you know, one of the things I think is we, we those of us who are coastal, tends to struggle with what it's true. what's happening in the center of the country. And we see what that has fomented in our world now. What We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to wonder what somebody in Wichita And, and Nance, I just want to say thank you for making it accessible. Socioeconomic access, I think, is a problem that I struggle with all the time, and elitism through ticket prices right. in the theater writ large, in the American theater. Thank you for making it accessible. You know, stuff like uh, individual and collective action doesn't cost you anything. Sometimes maybe you bring in a potluck, right? Starting it that way. We did that first list with $200 for stickers and cake and hundreds of lady hour. Right, so it doesn't cost a lot to, to take action and to, and to, as you all are doing in practice daily, showing up here with your bodies and your hearts and your minds, which is its own form of artivism or art activism. You know, I was just thinking something that was brought up, I think, earlier um, by by one of us, um, but it's a great question that I know we're starting to grapple with with the NPN is what is a play, because things are changing and it's like. You know, plays are something beyond the traditional playmaking idea of the two actor, three act. We should probably add Eurocentric <coughs> into yeah, that. Eurocentric. Right. <laughs> that, yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. My, right, the <laughs> semantics, and we all have a good word for it. Um, but yeah, and I think because we're starting to get in plays that don't adhere to a lot of, well, well, that's not really a play, it's a devised work, well, that's not you know really a play, it, it's fantastical, you know, it's not producible, whatever. And I think those questions are really great because things are changing. Um, and I think, because we have, one of our theaters, you know, we change every time we do a play, it, we, according to what the playwright needs or what that play needs, it needs a, not a proscenium stage, it needs something that is, um, just odd, <laughs> and so it's like, okay, <laughs> we'll make the room odd, you know, and set it up in a different way, but I think the, um, the structure is really speaking to a lot of people who are writing, yeah. um, and I think that it's really fascinating, but you, you have to get used to seeing a differently made play, and we have had an interesting feedback sometimes from an audience. It's like, well, what was it about? You know, I didn't understand the, you know, the climax at the end of the first act. You know, I mean, it's we're geared to reading and seeing traditional patriarchal structure. Right, <laughs> right, and and we have to change that. I mean, you know, it's like you guys have to go with us, but we're the ones that have to to change what is being produced. Yeah, I, I, I will. You you guys have all heard me say this. I have the best job in American theater. Mm -hmm. I, it's astounding. I read new plays, I talk about new plays, I fly around the country, yeah. I see new plays, and I give people money so they can make new plays. So I am generally very well liked, which is an <laughs> excellent thing. Uh, but one of the great joys of what I get to do now is I don't ever have to say no anymore. After 25 years of producing where I more than once said to a playwright, did you really not want anyone to produce your play? Because the fact that you need two seven-year-olds who walk in at 10.45 at night at the end of your play for one scene <laughs> makes it unproducible, right? I don't have to say that anymore because now that I have 125 theaters and a worldwide audience, there's going to be somebody who's got those two seven-year-olds whose parents will let them stay up and walk But Nan, now we have puppets, and I'm just a real <laughs> advocator right. of that. Right. Always the puppets. Um, but I, I think the, that the world is, is changing, how we produce plays is changing, and technology has changed, with, be it puppets or be it you know, uh, projections and how things work. And there are so many ways to make theater. There's so many, what a generative artist looks like. Uh, is so different now. We worked on the triple play study, which was a, a study that was done around the country where playwrights were invited to interview audience members about their interactions with new work. 
but the person doing the interviewing was not introduced to that audience member as a playwright, mm -hmm. just as here's someone who's helping the theater think about these questions. And one of those questions was, would you like to have dinner with a playwright? Mm -hmm. And even though they had been seated with a playwright that they didn't realize was one, um, often for what was supposed to be a, you know, a 25 minute interview went 45 minutes or an hour. So they're obviously having a great time talking to this person. The universal answer to that question was no. I would not <laughs> like to have dinner with a playwright. Um, and for two reasons. One, because a person's image of a playwright is British Billy with his little cocked hat and, you know, and, uh, you know, some, or someone stuffy and why would you want to do that? Or the other thing was, uh, you know, a playwright seemed as though it would be someone who was so elevated that that person wouldn't be able to talk to them, yet they were having this amazing conversation. Uh, and especially as we work very hard to diversify what our playwright pool is that is getting access to productions and development so that they look like uh, not only our current audiences, but our aspirational audiences. It becomes more and more important, I think, to, to share that and to spread the wealth and to have everybody have a right to have a voice out there. The energy, the vibrational energy happening up here is really yeah. extraordinary. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so uh, thank you. I for would all say of too these. that I think that there's been this huge, huge groundswell, phenomenal work for years, for decades. We've just not had access to it, right? So the the huge, huge, phenomenal group of African American playwrights that are ascending in New York, like 15, 20, 25, like I couldn't even name everybody who's coming up, whereas maybe like eight, 10 years ago, sometimes it felt anecdotally in the field like only three to five writers could have their say at any mm -hmm. time and the entire country was producing the same three to five African American new plays. And it's like, what is that scarcity about, right? We've cracked open the table and, um, and the undeniability of the material that was always there is just now being given mm -hmm. a platform. Great. Can we just add just a little bit um, at, uh, before we wrap things up here? I'd actually, we've talked about some of the challenges and some of the things that you've all done over the years. Um, I'm wondering actually about what you're most excited about in the American theater today. So we've got, uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah. I'm gonna start. So I'm going to just list some people that are doing really interesting work that I think people need to actually just pay attention to. So listen carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I am about to start preaching. Uh, <laughs> so I'm thinking of people like, and I mean, uh, Rain Grayson, Shelley Fort, Colette Robert, Charlie Yvonne Simpson, Matthew Capodacasa, Emma Staunton, Frankie Gonzalez, Alexandra Espinoza, like these, and I mean, there are so many more. But these are playwrights who are writing really interesting, provocative work about experiences that I think need to be seen on stage. Like, you know, especially people like, for example, Rain Grayson is writing plays specifically about um, his trans experience and like what is it like, you know, to be a young person um, in that situation and trying to figure out how to transition in a world that is very hostile at times to uh, trans individuals. So I mean, there, there are just so many amazing artists and I'm really excited that there are just so many ways now that we can get access to that work. That makes me hopeful. You know, so the only thing I'm hoping that, you know, happens on the other side is that we follow through now that that access is there. You know, do we continue forth with that? And now I'm just like watching with the dramaturgical way that I do that is a combination of hopefulness and side eye. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> that uh, people will really pay attention and really like cultivate that work. Because I think, you know, back to, I think we're finally starting to grapple with the fact that people, for I think there was a, a sort of like the scarcity mentality that you talked about before when this ain't pie, like there are all, there are all sorts of theaters out there doing all sorts of things. There's, there's a lot of pies, there's a lot of cake. If you don't like any of that, there's some croissants, like whatever it is. There, it's there, and so really just, um, and I think the other thing that's on the other side of some of this access that things like NPX has done, et cetera, has allowed smaller theaters that don't have the, like, the economic capital to get in on some of those things. Like once upon a time you had to know someone in order to be able to get access to things. Um, now that that's not a thing. You know, and I mean, obviously, if anyone ever is like, you know what, I just don't, I just don't know, please email the literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas, because I can give you all kinds of lists, <laughs> all kinds of people, and if I don't know, then I'm sure I can send you in the right direction. 
<laughs> well, and the beauty of this right now, too, is that you just had this fantastic list, and I'm sure there will be more, is that right. you can actually go to HowlRound.com, because this is being live streamed, but they I haven't, th it's archived, it's ar archived, I don't know where that came from, <laughs> it's archived, so you can actually go back and, <laughs> it's for the Brits in the room. Um, okay, great, yes. I just want to sort of add to that list. I want to note, uh, those of you who follow the Pulitzers, like uh, March Madness, like I do, uh, this year, um, all three finals for the Pulitzer Prize in Drama were women. Jackie Sibley's jury took home the big prize for Fairview. And again, it's really not, I don't, I don't think of it as competition. I think of it all as honor. Mm -hmm. Heidi Schreck, uh, her play is on Broadway currently. You can check it out there and support. She's also worked for a Tony. Claire Barron, who's been blowing apart the idea of what it means to have a multiplicity of uh, female uh, and gender inclusive uh, perspectives on stage. Those three women were honored. Um, Dominique Morso is up for uh, writing the book for uh, her Tony, the Tony nominated uh, show. Um, my God, I just blanked on the title. Help me. Uh, what? No, no, no. Dom's no, uh, Temptations means. Uh, oh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, ain't too proud. proud. Oh my God, ain't yes. too proud. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I'm gonna throw some more writers at you. There's so many. Dominique Morso, Heidi Schreck, Dipika <coughs> Dua, who is here this weekend, yeah. Alicia Harris, people who are pushing form as Dipika is, as Alicia is, who are writing outside of the norm of what a traditional well-made play is. Diana O, oh, yeah. Lauren Yee, mm -hmm. Mona Mansoor, C.A. Johnson, Sylvia Corey, Charlie Yvonne Simpson, Hilary Bettis, Monet right. Hurst Mendoza, M.J. Kaufman, et cetera, et cetera, you get it. <laughs> use that exchange and filter to your heart's delight. Um, and I just want to say something about uh, what is exciting to me too is the, the ongoing build of this uh, community of generosity, mm -hmm. of writers supporting other writers, of advocates uh, and artists and activists and folks in the um, working within traditional regional theater systems, uh, entrenched and established to create the next for the next generation of theater leaders. Um, and all of you, are, again, are an active part of that. So thank you for joining us on the front lines. Um, it's interesting because, of course, I do new plays and I find new plays and produce them and direct them, but we're also a theater. And I just think what has happened in the last, I'm going to say, 10 years, but even in the last two years in theater, um, since I've been in theater and f for 40 years, it's com it's completely changing. And that has a lot to do with access. I mean, it's not only in the plays that we see being written and that we can get produced, but also in how you sell a ticket or how you don't sell a ticket and you ask for a pay whatever you can ticket or um, how people's buying habits have changed. I mean, everything in this landscape has changed and everybody has bucked this for so many years. No, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing and, and, and people are no longer doing that and I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and that, I think, creates more writers. We're right now doing uh, a world premiere of Bond by a local playwright, and he's a vet, and it's about his experience in Iraq. Well, we started, as of this morning, veterans writing workshops no. for guys that wanna not only write, but potentially have them performed, and so that they would become a play as opposed to maybe just an essay. Um, so to try to create people who don't have a voice, who might feel disenfranchised and being able to even write about that experience. So, I mean, I just think the development work that we can do as theater owners is, you know, that, that we have to, it's a great, huge responsibility. And I do not take that lightly. And so I just wanna create new writers and just have that, that place that people can create collaboratively because, um, to be able to work with the writer side by side, which is what we now do, is a phenomenal experience, as opposed to just, you know, you get a play and you just do what you want with it. We no longer do what we want, we do what needs to happen. Um, and it's just, yeah, and I don't have any names for you, but you know, you just come to the unicorn, you'll see all those people <laughs> they just <laughs> talked about. I'm really excited, uh, not only about what's happening with artists and access, but what's happening with audiences. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can sit here in a room with a lot of people for 9.45 on a Saturday morning, <laughs> um, which in, in theater speak is, you know, like saying at... It's like two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, but to see our audiences expanding and changing, 
Um, and I think a part of that is about new work. You know, when you see a new play here at the Rep or at Unicorn or you come to a festival, you're not just being an, arti uh, an audience member, you too become an artist because your responses, you're laughing, you're not laughing, your feedback that you give to the director who you meet in the lobby or the playwright or the, the folks here, Cynthia, that all goes into that next production. So I wanna encourage you to embrace that part of the artist within yourself and think about what's next. Tell people about the plays that you saw, even if it's not your favorite play. Uh, another, last year between the 2nd of January when I was with some fine folks that are here in Creed, Colorado for a workshop, through uh, the 4th of March, I saw, read, or saw readings of 64 plays. And although I probably can't tell you the full storyline of, of them, or in, in a lot of cases, who even wrote the play, um, I can tell you about a moment an instant, an image, a line, something that stuck with me. And I will encourage you as you see new work to find that and to share that and be able to say to the person you're sitting next to uh, at your, uh, your religious service that you go to or your club or at your favorite diner, hey, you know what I, I did? I, I went and saw a play and it was amazing. Or I didn't really like it, but there was this one thing that <coughs> stuck with me, right? So share your wonderful enthusiasm and knowledge with everybody. We've learned in that triple play study um, several things which uh, are interesting and are gonna be really evocative for the field, but um, w one of them is that even after a, someone sees a play, they often don't know who the playwright is, um, and they often, it doesn't matter to them. In the same way you watched TV shows that you love and most of you probably could not tell you, tell us who the writers are, but I'll guarantee if it's a great show that you love and the story is intriguing you, there is a playwright in that writer's room. Mm -hmm. And that is why television, in my opinion, has done this, we're living in this golden age of writers and voices. Um, so. I encourage you to join us in the golden age, not only by coming out on Saturday morning, but we learned that people come to the theater for two reasons. One, because someone asked them to go with them. It's a social event. And two, because the story in some way resonates with them. Either they, it speaks to them personally or it's about something they don't know but would like to know more about. So share those stories of your experiences with going to the theater with everybody you run into. And I just wanna add on to what Nan said um, 100%. Like I think that there's so many ways, of it, you I feel like in some ways are part of the choir, like we're preaching to the choir, right? But what you do in your individual actions every day, being here, buying tickets, talking about the work, buying a copy of your favorite play, gifting it to others, even browsing your local Barnes and Noble and letting them know your local bookseller. Thank you so much for stocking new plays. You know as many women on the shelf as I would love. I have some ideas for you. Or could I help bring in a playwright to host a reading or a conversation or a signing, right? Beginning with the idea of party and community and, col and individual action. Mm -hmm. I just wanna thank you for what you all are doing sort yeah. of each and every day in that way because it accumulates. You are all activists for showing up. So thank you yep. for being here. Um, just a few things. I know we need to move on out of here because we need to set up for Kyle Hatley's reading of Frankenstein, which is very exciting. Um, so I, we don't have time for questions, but we are gonna go out and have coffee. And so please feel free to ask, uh, you know, have a chat as we're having coffee. Um, uh, at two o'clock, we have another another conversation. I wanna thank HowlRound uh, for hosting us today. We'll be having another two o'clock central time. Um, another panel, the deepening the conversation, and um, and at, and then we have for all of you here at 4:15 we have the reading of Legacy Land, which will also be in this room. Um, the Origin KC New Works Festival is made possible with lead financial support from the Copaken Family Fund, H&R Block, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, this project is supported in part by the City of Kansas City, Missouri Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund, and Casey Rep is underwritten in part by the Missouri Arts Council. All of these events 
are free today, um, except for the productions, which some of you may have already been to in the last couple of weeks with previews. Um, but if you've enjoyed in this event, um, we hope that you will help support Origin KC and keep making these events free by making a donation on your way out. We accept cash and checks and credit cards via this cool little thing called a dip jar. You can just stick your credit card in there. And um, double dipping is encouraged. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our amazing <laughs> panelists. And we will see you soon. Thank you.